Hey everyone, this is Ranger Jake here in Yellowstone National Park, and today we are broadcasting from the historic Lamar Buffalo Ranch in Lamar Valley. Uh, it's about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the, you know, it's it was below zero this morning, so we waited a little bit to broadcast until uh, the temperatures warmed up. The technology performs a little better once it's a little warmer. Uh, but you can see we still have some snow out here. Some of the higher elevations is starting to melt on some of the south-facing slopes. Uh, but the reason uh, that we're broadcasting out at Lamar Valley is because today we're going to be talking about the past, present, and future of bison management in Yellowstone National Park. And I can't think of any better person to talk about that than our bison program coordinator, Chris Jeremiah. He's going to be joining us today. A little background on Chris. He, um, he's been working for the bison program in Yellowstone National Park for over 20 years, and he has a PhD in studying diseases uh, in wildlife, particularly in bison in Yellowstone National Park. So uh, we're really excited to have this conversation today and to learn a little bit uh, to share with you about the past, present, and future, future of uh, bison management. So with that, I'm gonna jump behind the camera and we'll have a little conversation and I'll have Chris come on the camera. Thanks for the, the introduction, Jake. And uh, now it's always exciting to come out here to the Buffalo Ranch. In terms of the, the park service, it's, a, it's an iconic place. It's a very special place. And when I come out here, I think about things like, what would this park be like if we didn't have bison? And you know, what, even more so than that, what would this world be like if bison had gone extinct? You know, back in the uh, the late 1800s, that almost happened. You know, we had had 30 to 60 million animals that once roamed this continent, from up in Canada to down to Mexico, east towards the Appalachians, west towards the the Great Basin. You know, the plains were the epicenter of the great buffalo herds. You know, people would talk about uh, riding through the great herds for days, you know, as the wagons headed west out across, across the plains. And in the blink of time, they were almost gone. A couple hundred animals you know, were left on the continent in the late 1800s. And that was due exclusively to overhunting. Overhunting for sport, overhunting as a way to remove a, the most valuable food that sustained Native Americans. You know, overhunting is a way to really just get rid of buffalo from this country. And here in Yellowstone, it's the home, it was the land of the last of the wild bison. There were about two dozen animals that were here that, uh, you know, were the last of them. You know, it would be about 20 miles this way, you know, south of here. And um, that was in 1900. And in 1902, we decided that that probably wasn't enough. You know, there was a chance that those wild animals would just go extinct because there were so few of them. So we reached out to a few other places in North America where there were still buffalo. You know, the walking coyote herd of the today's Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, which was then sold to Pablo and Allard and eventually moved those animals up to Elk Island Park in Canada today. We took 18 females, you know, from the walking coyote herd. They were all pregnant at the time. We reached out to Charles Goodnight in Texas, who had owned a couple buffalo, brought three bulls up here from his herd. And we put them together and we created the Buffalo Ranch as a place to, to ranch, to raise, to bring Buffalo back to Yellowstone, bring Buffalo back to this country. And uh, the first couple years, what we did is we, uh, you know, if you can look by where I'm facing, which is out into the Lamar Valley, we, uh, we tilled the grasses that were here. And we... You know, we put little uh, irrigation ditches in the creeks, Rose Creek, leaving from right below me. And we started growing hay for raising a whole bunch of buffalo. 
You know, there was a time in the, the early 1900s where you'd look out into Lamar Valley and what you would see were fenced groups of buffalo. You would see, you know, riders on horseback kind of moving the buffalo around from day pen to day pen. You'd see, you know, people out cutting hay. You'd see the giant piles of hay out in the valley. You'd see fences that would keep other animals off of this area so that the hay would be here for the, for, you know, for the buffalo in the winter. And um, at the same time, there was something else going on. If you go about 25 miles south of here, 20 miles south of here, there was the wild herd. And those wild herd were still numbering, numbering in about two dozen animals. And they were just doing what buffalo do, just roaming around the high country. And uh, in the winter, they were living around some thermal features in the Pelican Valley. And every so often you'd see glimpses of them if you were if you were living at the Buffalo Ranch. You'd see them kind of come over the crest of these hills and then they'd kind of go back. And as we got into the 1920s and the 1930s, we started releasing the animals from the Buffalo Ranch. And we would haze them up into the high country and then use those same fences that used to keep all the animals out. We would keep the you know, the introduced buffalo out of here for the winter and hope that they would mix with the wild herd. And they did. And they, you know, they would breed together. They would migrate together over the course of the summer. And then in the fall, we'd go right up on these hills on horseback, haze the animals back down here and um, hold them here for the winter and feed them hay. Hay that we grew here, hay that we grew up Slough Creek and some other areas of the park. In uh, the mid to late 30s, we took animals from here, about 71 of them, and we moved them to the Firehole, which is by Old Faithful, and we moved them to the Hayden Valley, and we started to repopulate other areas of this park. And that was really the story for the first 50 or 60 years of buffalo conservation. It was raising animals here, reintroducing them to other areas of the park, Really, you know, having a, you know, a husbandry approach to bringing buffalo back here. Had those techniques ever been done in any sort of a national park before? Were we copying everything or, or any place? Or was it like, this is the first place and we're just kind of experimenting here? Gosh, that's a really good question. You know, and that reminds me, I left out kind of an important detail that I didn't want to talk about. Um, we really were the first ones to give it a shot at trying to restore buffalo to this country. You know, today, there's probably about 19 federal public bison herds. Those are between the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Park Service, um, the Bureau of Land Management. And those 19 herds probably number about 11,000 animals. And of those 11,000, about 5,500 live here right in Yellowstone, so about half of them. You know, the other half are spread across those other 18 herds. All well, those other 18 herds are generally pretty small. Most of them are one to 200 animals. There's a few that are larger, upwards of 1,000. Most of those herds are fenced. Most of those herds are rounded up every summer, or sorry, every fall. And then animals are pulled from the herd and culled in order to control numbers at, you know, at a set carrying capacity for each park or each Fish and Wildlife Service reserve. And we do that because that's the model that was generally developed for buffalo conservation. That's not the model we use for wolves or elk or trout or eagles. It's just what this country has kind of, what we've kind of decided is what, what works. And, uh, you know, the question you ask is, like, are other people doing what we do here? And I'd say, uh, you know, not so much. You know, we still represent, Yellowstone still represents that leading edge of, you know, is it possible to put big numbers of buffalo back on big, wide open landscapes, restore intact ecosystems that have predators, that have herbivores, that have them interacting in, you know, a place where they're allowed to just do exactly that. So, uh, you know, after we went through that ranching period, as we got into the late 1960s, we said, well, let's, let's try something a little different. Let's just let the herds go. 
let's stop all let's shut the buffalo ranch let's stop the relocating animals around the park let's just see if it works we've got millions of acres inside this national park let's just see if it works and sure enough it does and it did and it does you know over the 60s the 70s the 80s the bison population did some great things it started to grow exponentially it uh animals began to relearn migrations moving from the high country up here in lamar following the rivers down towards the park boundary in Gardner, Montana, in West Yellowstone. You know, the animals learned to, to move in sync with the landscape. Uh, wolves were restored to the park as we moved into the 90s. And, uh, you know, we wound up with this ecosystem that's, that's just in balance today. Today, when you look at Yellowstone, when I look at Yellowstone, what I see is is a place where you have wolves and other predators, you know, having the, 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 these trickle-down effects on everything that you see here, to the places that elk use, to the types of plants that grow in riparian areas, to having this big herbivore that evolved that's larger than all of its predators, having this bubble-up effect on the economy or the ecosystem of Yellowstone, you know, changing the, the timing and the, the rate at which plants grow, stimulating the amount of, you know, the amount that plants grow and when they grow and changing those plant communities. So you've kind of got this, this Yellowstone today that, that, that is this balance between top predators and, the, you know, the mega herbivore that's really setting the stage for a park that's probably in a better state than it has been since it was created 150 years ago. It's funny, you know, when I go out here today, you know, I'm out here with park visitors or whatnot, you know, a lot of people don't know exactly what they're looking at. You know, they might come out here and, you know, a lot of times if, if you ask people to say, what does a pristine ecosystem look like? And you close your eyes, you know, you'll see, you know, the snow-capped mountains. You'll see the, you know, the, the meadows with the rivers winding through them. You'll see the, you know, the trees on the side of the mountains, the cottonwoods and the aspens turning yellow in the fall. You see waist-high grasses blowing in the wind. You see maybe like a little group of elk off in the corner of the trees, or you know, maybe you see some prong. You know, that's the image we've all been taught as like what, what an ecosystem, what a, you know, the, the mon you know, this area should look like. Well, in reality, it's that's. That's one option of what it could look like. But we've learned through a century and 50 years, so whatever 150 is called, you know, we've learned that that's, that might not be exactly what a bison-dominated system looks like. You know, what you see when you come out here today are really short grasses. And um, they're that way the entire year because the animals keep returning the bison keep returning to regraze the same places like mowing the lawns on a golf course and that stimulates the grasses to be productive and lush you see dirt mounds called wallows all over the place just peppering this landscape like a checkerboard which are places where bison roll and they you know they've they've removed the vegetation from that area and they get in that dust and that dust is a way to avoid insects and you also see um you know poop <laughs> literally poop everywhere like you like you took pepper and just peppered it all over a salad and um that's what this system looks like and um a lot of people don't expect that they you know they ask me is this okay and i'm like it's better than okay it's um it's exactly what this place should look like the thing with bison though is that i you know, as I said, we're the only really federal area, or one of the few federal areas that's trying to test this idea of whether or not bison can be managed like a wild animal. You know, allowed to, to go where they choose, to roam where they please, allowed to their numbers to vary with the weather, with disease, with predation, and some human harvest, you know, like elk populations, pronghorn, deer, even predators are somewhat regulated by human harvest outside protected areas like national parks. 
as the bison population swelled and grew through the 80s and 90s and all of these good things that were going on that I talked about, you know, we learned a really important lesson here in Yellowstone. We learned that um, outside of the park, bison might not be valued the same way they're valued inside the national park. When bison, which follow rivers as they migrate, you know, followed rivers and exited the park, we were sued by, you know, the states that the animals migrated into. We were sued to, to say that these animals are not okay outside of the national park. We don't, we're not ready to have them outside of the park because of threats to people, threats to private property, threats to, um, to livestock, you know, both food for livestock and giving diseases to livestock. So we, we you know, we, we had a, a standstill. We spent 20 years, maybe it wasn't quite 20 years, but upwards of two decades in court negotiation with the state of Montana, trying to figure out what should we do when animals exit the park. We were in a, in a really tough position. Everybody was. But um, I think of my predecessors. This would have been right before I came to Yellowstone. You know, I came to Yellowstone to implement the plan that my predecessors developed through those, those years of court negotiation. But I can, only, I can only imagine being in their footsteps. And one option was, well, you could manage the park like we manage the other federal areas, which would have meant putting up, you know, corrals all over this park and rounding up animals and controlling numbers uh, every year, uh, you know, and you'd control them by sending those animals away, likely to slaughter. And we would have done that to keep numbers at a low enough level that the animals didn't migrate outside of the park. That was one option that my predecessors faced. And they, that, w that was not what they decided to do. They spent time trying to negotiate the state of Montana to figure out a balancing act, a way to allow some movement outside of the park to begin to let people in, you know, in the surrounding com communities to see if they could live with bison, but we would control numbers to some extent so that the animals moving outside of the park didn't totally overwhelm their tolerance in modern society. That court negotiation, my predecessors created something called the Interagency Bison Management Plan. It's a plan between five federal and initially between five federal and state agencies. It was the two, two agencies from Montana, you know, the Park Service, the Forest Service, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, a federal entity that's used to, to deal with diseases that can be transmitted to livestock. You know, those, those agencies came together and came up with a joint management plan, realizing that bison are migratory, moved to areas of different jurisdictions, and it was how we're each going to play our part to conserve bison in this park, to reduce animals migrating outside of this park. And um, that was really it. Oh, yes, and also to protect the um, the economic interest of the livestock industry in the state of Montana. What does that have to do with this? A ton. You know, the animals in this park, bison, have brucellosis. Brucellosis is a cattle-borne disease. In cattle, it tends to cause calves to abort. More so than that, it is heavily regulated. This country went through great lengths to eradicate brucellosis in domestic animals and we pretty much have gotten there except in a few places where it lives in wildlife where wildlife originally got it from bison many many years ago anyway if a private herd tests positive for brucellosis what can happen is that you could be put into quarantine meaning you need to start testing your animals, seeing if they have this disease, killing the ones that have the disease, potentially vaccinating others, and showing that you don't have a disease for a certain amount of time. And if you can do that, you can be released from quarantine. You can imagine that can have a lot of impact on a local producer. You know, you don't, you don't plan for those types of crises. 
At the same time, if that happens in more than one place in an area in one year, one place within a state in one year, you know, that's a sign that there's a lot more of the disease in, in the livestock of the area than you think. And the entire state is put under some form of sanction or quarantine, meaning you can't transport livestock parts inside or outside of your state. Now we've moved beyond there and there's more details to it, but the bottom line is brucellosis, if transmitted from bison to livestock, could really threaten the economic integrity of the people who live outside of this park. Where to from here? Well, we've really spent the last 20 years trying to, uh, to implement, or I've spent my career basically trying to implement this interagency bison management plan. So what that means is that when animals start to migrate outside of the park, we, uh, we either haze them back into the park, we round them up near the park boundary, into facilities that look, you know, a more contemporary version of these corrals, and those animals are sent to slaughter. They're, the meat from those animals is given to Native American tribes, uh, you know, and um, that's been the way to control bison numbers, to keep the population, you know, larger than it it ever has been. I mean, we're at the largest number of animals we've ever had in the park, but to not allow the population to just grow exponentially. At the same time, it's meant um, limiting where bison can roam. So we've established, or I should say the state of Montana has established tolerance areas outside of the park that identify where bison can be, and where they cannot. And when animals roam outside of those areas, they move back inside the park. We're at the point, well, I guess there's some more details too. You know, as, the, as we've, we've implemented this plan over decades, there's, there's a lot of things we've learned. One is that there's a way to to engage other stakeholders that you know, are, are connected to Yellowstone bison. One of those being you know, Native Americans or American Indians. You know, over time, various tribal entities became members of the Interagency Bison Management Plan. Some of those tribes, their goal was to return live bison back out to Indian country. Others were to use triatized hunts to harvest animals that have exited in the park and otherwise would be rounded up and sent to slaughter. Today, there's upwards of eight Native American tribes that harvest animals when they exit the park. There's also another group called, called the Intertribal Buffalo Council that works with us to try to return bison back to Native American lands. We've spent uh, much of the last 10 years trying to figure out, is there a way to get live Yellowstone bison back out of this park? I should have, you know, a lot of people ask me that right off the back. Why don't you just, you know, catch the ones that are leaving the park and send them alive elsewhere to zoos, to other public lands, to tribes, to places where they could live out their lives. Um, it wasn't possible until just recently. The reason why is that the animals in this park have that disease called brucellosis. If you went out into the herds today, roughly 50 to 60% of the animals would test positive for being exposed to the disease using a blood test. And state of Montana law prohibits the transfer of animals across state highways alive unless they're first certified as brucellosis free. That ain't an easy thing to do. It, uh, you can't just uh, test an animal one time and say that it does or does not have brucellosis. The bacteria you know, has this, this tricky way 
of getting into the body and then lying in a, in a latent or inactive form for a long period of time, maybe upwards of a year before it becomes active and the body recognizes it. And therefore you can detect it using blood tests that test for things called antibodies, which are the body's response to disease. So we worked with the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service and the state of Montana and the Assiniboine and Sioux tribes of Fort Peck to develop a procedure to identify animals as brucellosis free, send them back out to tribal areas. Now this program is called the Bison Conservation Transfer Program. It's led to the largest transfer of Yellowstone bison back out to Native American tribes in history. Now these numbers don't sound like a lot. They sound symbolic at best. Uh, as 182 animals in the last three years moved out to roughly 20 tribes. And um, it is symbolic right now because at the same time, thousands of animals have been either harvested or sent to slaughter outside of the park. And uh, you know, everything I've learned with bison is that it takes time. It takes time, you know, building the trust with the different stakeholders. You know, it's, it's really, a, you know, a previous superintendent told me once with bison, probably with everything, but he was talking about bison. You know, every complex problem has a simple solution that's wrong. And I, I, you know, I live that every day. You know, every day we're trying to figure out what, what can we do to move, you know, to break new ground on restoring bison. You know, standing here at the Buffalo Ranch, this is where it all started. We built these pastures. We brought animals back to this park. It's the greatest conservation of this park in its history. You know, when we took them down, that's probably an even bigger conservation story. And what we did is we moved these pastures down to the park boundary because modern society and the states weren't ready for bison to leave national parks. And we used them to catch animals that were leaving and kill them. And now we've moved beyond that to some extent. We figured out how to also catch them and within the constraints of today's world, move them back out to start other herds among people who care about them as much as anyone. Native Americans who have a unique connection to Yellowstone bison. You know, they see these animals as uh, closest ancestral connection possible because this is what was the last of the wild buffalo. These were the last animals that weren't rounded up, put behind some fences, or put on a reservation. So getting them back and becoming a, a stakeholder and a steward for this issue going forward, I mean, that was, it's a huge success. You know, and all of this stuff just takes time. Like, I, I think that my role here in Yellowstone is, you know, biding more time for these animals, you know, for this population. And um, seeing when, you know, when the world's ready to kind of make another step, we'll be ready to, to oblige, to help. But in the meantime, we need to, you know, only go as far as the common ground of all the different stakeholders that are involved with bison. One thing that we're doing right now is working on a new management plan. You know, the original one was called the Interagency Bison Management Plan. You know, the park is re-looking at how do you manage bison exclusively within the park. It's not to rewash the 20 years of interagency and intertribal coordination that we've worked through. It's more to solidify many decisions that have been made along the way to say that these are things that we've all agreed to and we've realized they work. So let's use this as the baseline for moving forward. So what are some of those things? You know, the original management plan thought there should be about a max of 3,000 animals in this park. Well, today there's, there's 5,500. And when you look at the capacity of this landscape, it can support eight to 10,000 animals or more. That's new science. 
that's part of you know establishing this new baseline that this park can sustain many 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 more bison than we thought originally and it benefits the park we've learned that with larger numbers we can control the conflicts outside of the park and that the way <laughs> the way we've done that is just building trust with the different agencies over time another new piece of information that came out was that elk also have brucellosis. And the original management plan had a lot to do with brucellosis management. And um, the infection is in the elk that are standing next to the bison in this park. And those elk don't have the same constraints of bison, meaning they can move across the, the, the park line as they choose and uh, in fact transmit brucellosis to livestock in this area 30 times in the last two decades. You know, that information is important information to have because what it tells me is that really it's, um, bison aren't valued as much as elk in this ecosystem outside of the park. And just being able to have that conversation is a new baseline that we need to have in this new plan. You know, going forward, 50 years from now, when uh, somebody else is doing this video, about the, what would that be, the bison centennial? The bison <laughs> um, You know, I hope these are the things that they talk about. I hope they say that we're glad that, you know, the 200 years that came before this, you know, spent 100 years recovering bison to this ecosystem, 50 years really arguing about how do we treat bison in the modern world and develop, develop you know, just how do we do that, and then making it happen over the, the next 50 years, where in ways that you know all of the you know in ways that that all of the stakeholders can agree to we can see bison similar to elk or similar to wolves or similar to all of the animals that this park protects and allow them to move back and forth across boundaries you know in ways that where we help folks outside of the park and um and it works you know i hope we see a a, a stronger connection between the park service and tribes in uh, sharing the stewardship for Yellowstone bison through, you know, implementing hunts outside of the park and through returning live bison to tribal areas and to, you know, really becoming partners in how, in how we, how we do this. You know, I hope we, uh, we continue to study this grassland and this ecosystem. And as this climate warms and as this climate dries, which would, would affect how the plants grow in this system, that we're able to adapt and continue to manage the bison population and other th the other resources of this park in ways where we're, we're always forward thinking so that we can deal with all the challenges and changes that are come over the next 50 years so that uh, you know, people in a long time from now can come out here in the summertime and see thousands of animals moving across this landscape. There's not another place on the planet where you can see that happen. And um, thanks for the time, Jake. Yeah. I'll go ahead and jump on camera here. You want to scoot over? Yeah, just right there is good. He can stay on here. I want to thank, uh, I'd like to say, Chris for having the conversation, but this guy is so good at what he does. It wasn't much of a conversation. And so thanks for taking the time to come out here and talk about bison management in Yellowstone. Uh, and thank you so much for uh, joining us for this next installment of our virtual video series. I hope that uh, you learned a little thing or two about what we're doing here in bison with bison management in Yellowstone and why it's so important, um, like uh, such a critical issue here. Uh, so thanks for following along. And uh, again, thanks for all of your support for Yellowstone National Park.